moving on to pituitary adenomas, uh, micro adenomas are less than 10 mm, macro adenomas are more than 10 mm and micro are far more common and uh, more than 75% of these are endocrinologically active. Microadenoma is the commonest tumor and these are typically seen as very well demarcated lesions which are hypo on T1 and hyper on T2 but that signal difference is not very great so you have to use narrow window settings to sort of pick up that uh, lesions and uh, anyway if you are looking for a microadenoma you have to do the contrast study uh, to pick it up. Uh, this is an example of microadenoma. So as I said, look at the T2 and T1. You can barely make out, but there is a suspicious lesion just in the left paramedian location there and subtle hypointensity on the T1 there. But once you do the dynamic post-contrast imaging, you can see this hypo-enhancing microadenoma with the normal intensely enhancing pituitary parenchyma around it. So that makes the diagnosis quite simple. This is a woman with Cushingoid features. And again, you can see on uh, the T2, there is a more obvious lesion in the left lateral portion of the cella with a slightly speckled appearance. And even on the contrast, it is showing that speckled appearance, but it is generally hypo-enhancing compared to the normal pituitary parenchyma. So that will again confirm a diagnosis of a microadenoma. Now, when we are looking at microadenomas, many times you get patients, you know, with prolactin levels which are just 50 and 60. Generally, that is not a setting for microadenomas. Usually, if there is a prolactin secreting microadenoma, the levels are way high, more than 120 to 150 nanogram per ml, the normal being less than 20. And many times, if we can't pick up a microadenoma, especially the ACTS secreting one, uh, the patient may have to undergo petrosal venous sampling to sort of identify which side of the pituitary is secreting it. And then maybe they can do a uh, surgical excision of that half of the pituitary uh, to remove that microadenoma. Moving on to macroadenomas, these are larger tumors. Uh, the epicenter is in the cella, which is generally enlarged, and they will grow out of the diaphragma, producing a figure of eight appearance. The important thing you have to understand is that hemorrhage and necrosis are a very common feature of this adenoma, although it's a benign tumor. And uh, uh, it's a soft tumor, so even if it encases the ICA, very seldom will you see actual luminal narrowing or uh, obliteration of the ICA uh, lumen. So this is a classical uh, macroadenoma. So you see this large tumor here with cellar, supracellar, and then right paracellar component, which is involving the right cavernous sinus, encasing the right ICA. The fluoride is well maintained. And on the T1 SAG and T1 post contrast, you can see the heterogeneous enhancement. It is extending posteriorly into the interpeduncular system and also anteriorly along the planum synoidal. Uh, the same patient on follow-up uh, with two years after giving bromocryptine and you can see how the tumor has markedly shrunken in response to the bromocryptine and it is now uh, uh, markedly reduced in bulk. Another example of pituitary macroadenoma, you see this typical configuration of the tumor with the supracellar and bilateral paracellar components which are involving the bilateral cavernous sinuses but again the ICF flowoids are encased but still well maintained. Now, even in a setting of macroadenoma, we do give a rapid multiphasic contrast imaging. That is because many times, even with a large macroadenoma, you can sometimes identify residual normal enhancing pituitary parenchyma displaced along one aspect of the macroadenoma. And this helps the neurosurgeon to salvage that whatever normal pituitary parenchyma he can. So in this case, you can actually see a good rind of normal enhancing pituitary parenchyma, which is actually splayed along the superior margin of the central portion of the macroadenoma. Another case of a macroadenoma which is having a three directional extension, so left paracellar, supracellar and then also a extension downwards into the sinoid sinus. So it can go in all the directions and here you can see the optic chiasm, that thin band of tissue, that is the optic chiasm splayed along the superior margin of the macroadenoma and again the common feature, involvement of the uh, uh, cavernous sinus, encasement of the ICA but maintained flow void. So this patient underwent, uh, this is the post-contrast imaging of the same patient. You can see the moderately enhancing tumor going into the sinoid sinus. And on the post-operative imaging, you see that the surgeon has been able to excise all the cellar component, supracellar component, the infracellar component, but obviously he has left behind that left cavernous sinus component. So this is that margin of the residual tumor, which will now have to be followed up or which can be treated with radiotherapy. So obviously this is the area where the surgeon would not go. 
So when we are looking at the cavernous sinus involvement with the macroadenomas, one has to give the NOPS classification in the report because this is a very reliable system when you are looking at the cavernous sinus invasion. So one has to firstly understand that the macroadenomas are very soft tumors and benign tumors. So more likely they indent the cavernous sinus rather than actually invading the cavernous sinus. So while on imaging many times you feel there is invasion, on table uh, invasion is found less often. So this system takes all that into account. So what we do is we draw three tangent lines considering the supraclinoid ICA and the intracranial ICA and uh, cavernous sinus ICA. So uh, this is the medial tangent. Then one line through the center of the two ICAs, that is the uh, intercarotid line. And then the one along the lateral margin, so that is the lateral tangent. And then you look how far the lateral margin of the macroadenoma is going. So if it stays medial to the medial tangent, that is grade 0. If it comes between the medial tangent and the intercarotid line, so that will be grade 1. If it goes between the intercarotid line and the lateral tangent, that is grade 2. And if it goes beyond the lateral tangent, that is grade 3. Now grade 3 organ is subdivided if it is going in the superior recess of the cavernous sinus that is 3A, if it goes in the inferior recess that is 3B and if it encases the ICA completely that is grade 4. So what do these grades mean? Grade 0 and 1 means there is no invasion. So 1 means right till here. Huh? So you can imagine a pituitary adenoma coming right till here, it means there is no invasion of the cavernous sinus. It is generally just indenting the sinus. Grade 2 is possible invasion, grade 3 you will label as probable invasion and grade 4 encasement of the cavernous ICA that is the only sign of definite cavernous sinus invasion. So this is a system which has to be followed and we uh, mention it in all our reports of pituitary adenomas. Now this is a patient who presented with severe headache and blurred vision and on imaging what we see is a bulky pituitary gland which is bright on T2, pituitary stalk is displaced to the right. But more importantly, you see that the gland is also bright on T1. So that indicates hemorrhage within the pituitary and that is a classical pituitary apoplexy. So generally it's an adenoma which undergoes hemorrhage. And when we follow up the patient after four weeks, you can see now that T2 brightness has come down, the uh, size also has come down, the T1 brightness has gone away. And on post contrast, you see actually it is just showing rim enhancement with central necrosis because effectively it is a hemorrhagic necrosis of the adenoma. So apoplexy is a sudden hemorrhage and uh, just seeing hemorrhage in any adenoma, you cannot label it as an apoplexy. It has to have the clinical presentation of headache, blurred vision, that, ha that clinical scenario has to be there for you to call it an apoplexy because apoplexy, the word stands for that. And uh, uh, you, otherwise, because many adenomas will have some amount of hemorrhage in them. Now this is a different scenario. You have a patient with headache and left ophthalmoplegia. So you have a very large extraction lesion centered along the cella and going along the clivus. And again here you can see, but there is one difference. Can you tell me that one difference compared to the cases you saw till now? So look at the ICA. The ICA flow is obliterated. So that means this is not a soft tumor. This is a relatively harder tumor. And you can see that the left ICA flow is completely obliterated. So again, looking at more images, you can see this is having that dural tail which you all rightly picked up. And also you can see that the left ICA compared to the right ICA, the left ICA is completely obliterated. So this is a meningioma.